At this time, I want to um, change topics a little bit or change gears a little bit and welcome one of our faculty researchers who leads a major study that is supported and funded by Precision Health on the important area of opioid misuse. Dr. Chad Brummett is a professor and senior associate chair for research in the Department of Anesthesiology. He is also director of pain research and uh, one of the leading researchers on three uh, major uh, NIH grants in the areas of pain and opioid use. He also is a mad Twitter user. So if you have not followed Dr. Chad, you should. Um, I enjoy seeing his uh, topics and his, um, his uh, tweets a lot. Uh, he is joining us today to share with us a little more information about uh, Precision Health Project and how participant data is really helping us to address such a significant area, especially uh, for us here in Michigan. Again, if you have questions uh, for any of our speakers in this afternoon, please use the Q&A tab and um, we will then address those during our question and answer period. And with that, Dr. Brummett, I am going to sign off and turn the screen over to you. Terrific, uh, thank you. And, and Tina, I just wanna make sure I'm getting a prompt that says who can share, host only, all, all panelists. Um, I didn't know there'd be an extra click here, so I apologize, I'm, I'm not getting a normal prompt to share. Um, so if there's another button I need to click, should be able to. Let me try again. I'll go down to share. Here we go. Okay. Now working just fine. Almost certainly user error. Um, great. So uh, I'm, I'm Chad Brummett. I am a, I'm an anesthesiologist and a pain physician. Uh, I am not a geneticist, um, although I seem to be uh, getting progressively more involved in genetics research due to uh, my involvement in precision health. And, and for those that don't know, um, Gonzalo Abacasis popped himself down in my office in around 2011 and said, we want to build a biobank. And we started having conversation at that point. And uh, since that time, um, my team has recruited about 70,000 people uh, into an op this opt-in Michigan Genomics Initiative through the perioperative period. And it's been a really fun ride. And I'm going to talk about how um, my other research in, in chronic post-surgical pain and opioids and precision health all kind of came together. It was sort of a game of what I call academic twister with a hand here and a foot there. Um, it came together through this use case. Um, we have a few different funding sources from NIH. Um, these, are kind of, these are our active funding sources. We get a lot of support as well from Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, uh, including money that flows through the state from SAMHSA, CDC, as well as this Precision Health Initiative. I have a couple conflicts, but I won't discuss anything related to those conflicts today. So I think everybody's aware of the opioid epidemic, and it, 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 is a, it is a big deal. I mean, right now, even today, we know uh, amid in the era of COVID, um, this 130 deaths per day, which um, was almost hailed as a victory because we went from 134 to 130 deaths per day, maybe going up in the era of COVID. We're seeing some counties like Kent County where overdoses have increased by about 45%. And while everyone's aware of that, I, I'm always moved by the personal stories. And I, just for sake of time, I probably won't go through any today, but I have encountered multiple parents, family members, and friends who have lost children or loved ones to opioid overdose that started with an acute care prescription. What I mean was something from surgery, dentistry, emergency medicine. So, and I think the stigma associated with opioid overdose and opioid addiction has really made this a hard issue to discuss. Our group, um, Michigan Open, came together in 2016 uh, sort of acknowledging that most of the country was focused on all of the downstream effects of the opioid epidemic, what to do with the chronic opioid user, how to get more naloxone in the community, how to get more people um, with opioid use disorder, which is the diagnosis for opioid addiction, how to get them into treatment. Super important topics, topics that are still germane today, but at that time, nobody was really asking this question. You know, if we went to Michigan Medicine today, if we just drove down the street and we walked through the pre-op period, and we said, how many of these people are on opioids? Well, it's, it's, it's a bigger number than I think it should be. It's about 10 to 20% of the population coming in for surgery. But what it means is that we were not focusing on the majority of the people that we were caring for. And yet, these people were going to have a predictable opioid exposure. 
Because after surgery, I can predict who's going to get an opioid and how much they're going to get if you just give me two pieces of information. Tell me the surgeon caring for them and the surgery they're having, and I'll tell you what opioid they're going to get and how much. Because there was nothing from a precision medicine perspective about this. And this became an opportunity to think about prevention. We know for sure our best dollars spent are in prevention. And so this became an opportunity to think about prevention rather, rather than just treatment, and not only for that patient, but for their family and for their community. And we know that the relative contribution of, um, of surgery, dentistry, and emergency medicine is increasing. These are, uh, this was a study we did from a data set um, supported by Precision Health uh, from one of our former anesthesia residents. And what we did is we looked over a seven-year period, and we said among people in this national private payer database who were not using an opioid, meaning they had gone a whole year without filling an opioid, who gave them their first prescription after that year? And what we found was that over the seven year period, and this predates the CDC guidelines, which are really focused on primary care and chronic pain, even before this time period, we see that the relative contribution of surgery, dentistry, and emergency medicine is increasing. And not only that, surgeons off to the right here, you see this OME, which is known as oral morphine equivalence, or how much opioid they get, also increased meaningfully for surgeons over that time period, where at the bottom here, this big yellow category was largely just primary care and chronic pain. And even before CDC guidelines, primary care physicians were writing less opioid and, um, and also writing less amount when they were writing it. So this really was further evidence that we needed attention for surgery, dentistry, and emergency medicine. So again, this is Michigan Open. So this is, this is um, inter, you know, Michigan Open is integrated with um, Precision Health. And these were our broad goals early on when we started in 2016. We wanted to reduce opioid use after surgery and specifically saying we wanted to decrease the overprescribing. So for those surgeries where we thought opioids were warranted, we wanted to reduce the prescribing. We wanted to eliminate unnecessary exposures. In other words, if we think, it, think about things like dentistry, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that where there's evidence that opioids are actually not warranted, how do we get rid of those? And then how do we engage providers and communities? And this is a place where we've done, I, I think, really, really well. Um, so, so this is just sort of a schematic of something we've just put together for Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. This is the preamble to Michigan Open going up to July 2016. And this is the amount of opioid in oxycodone pills. So the y-axis there is the number of five milligram pills a person would get after a case mix of general vascular and gynecologic surgery. So very common surgeries. And the total data here is about, about 50,000 participants um, over 70 hospitals. And what you see is Michigan OPA started around July 6, 2016, and we started talking to surgeons about opioids, but without specific guidelines, and you see a decrease in prescribing. And then what happened to follow was we, we released our first guidelines in October 2017. These were actually the first evidence-based prescribing guidelines ever released for surgery. And I know that's shocking in October 2017. Other groups started to do work in the same space, but we, we had actually taken data from around our state to understand not only how much people were prescribed, but how much they used and made guidelines that were meant to be for people. And then as you see, we've released uh, guidelines to follow and now we're starting to see a decrease in the curve. Now, we certainly, and I get plenty of feedback on Twitter um, saying that uh, this is just doctors uh, worrying about nothing and we're not taking care of people, but these are data. And again, these data here are from about 40,000 people. Um, and um, what we see is, is that as we've decreased prescribing, uh, following the, rec the guidelines. Uh, we've also decreased consumption, this dash black line, and yet pain and satisfaction shown in red and blue have not moved. And, and, and again, this is a, these data are from about 35 hospitals around our state. So representing a wide case mix of, of patients um, and a lot of patients. And we really see no ill effect with, with this reduction in prescribing for these very common surgeries. And you could argue now we're actually prescribing a bit like our, um, some of our European colleagues um, in other parts of the world that have been known for a long time to prescribe a lot less. And while I didn't show it here, we actually have also have data that we are prescribing about half of what's happening in Indiana and Kentucky, even though those places have had um, state guidelines in place for longer than we have. And that, oh, I'm sorry, I did have that data. So these are the data from at the top here. This is Indiana and Kentucky. And what you can see is that over time, 
they have they implemented state policy limits uh, more than a year before us, but they haven't really seen that same level of engagement because we really have worked through a unique engagement at a state level. Um, and I, I think this last piece of like, you know, how do we eliminate unnecessary exposure is something I'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a minute, but I, I think these are important pieces. And we, we have um, also spent a lot of time educating providers. We've, we've done lectures for about 20,000 uh, providers over the last four years, um, as well as um, community-based presentations. And then um, when we talk about our community-based efforts, this is one of the ones that we're most proud of, and again, has been supported by Misher and Precision Health. Um, and this is an example of one of our four-hour um, opioid drives, like the DEA drives, but really with support from the core um, team of Michigan Open, with support of, of Precision Health and Misher, we actually help communities set up drives where they're out in the community, they're there, they're advertising in their own communities. And in just this one drive, um, 96 cities across our state, all 97 sites, I'm sorry, across our state in, in, um, in four hours, we got about 3,500 pounds of pills, taking our totals up to about uh, 13,000 pounds of pills over the last few years. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has put a little bit of a, a damper on that effort. We, we're, we're hoping to get back up in the fall. Um, but our group, I, everything I've shown you so far isn't really about precision health. It's really not individually caring for a participant in a different way or a patient in a different way. It's not really tailoring the unique aspects of the patient. And, and, and these are data from um, mostly from our group, except for one of the studies here, showing that um, one of the most common complications after surgery that we had not previously recognized is becoming a new chronic user or a new persistent opioid user. The concept's the same. It's basically that you come in not using opioids in the year prior, and you continue to use opioids or fill opioids long after. And so we would consider this a source of morbidity. In other words, I understand chronic post-surgical pain. We study cr chronic post-surgical pain. But as an example, this total knee and total hip arthroplasty study, 8% um, of the people after knee replacement kept using, these were people not using opioids beforehand, six months later, we're definitely still using, we've called the people, we asked them gold standard questions, and we asked them gold standard questions about change from before surgery to after surgery for their knee, and, and what we found is there's no association between using opioids long-term after that 8%, and how their, whether or not their knee or hip got worse. In other words, this cannot be simply explained by chronic post-surgical pain, which is something I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about understanding and treating chronic post-surgical pain. And unfortunately, we've seen this even with dentistry. This is something that is super common. We do about three and a half to five million wisdom tooth extractions in the US um, each year. And what we know is despite the fact that there are randomized control trials, in other words, the highest level of evidence to say that you shouldn't prescribe an opioid to treat um, pain after dental extraction. You should use acetaminophen and ibuprofen because they work as well or better and will avoid the nausea and vomiting and constipation. These data actually showed that even beyond the nausea, vomiting, constipation, just getting an opioid was independently associated with becoming a new chronic user. And so you start to do back of the envelope math, there could be like 50,000 people becoming new chronic users. And I did a spot on, on CBS Morning News um, last year where a, a, a woman got on and told the story of her daughter who got her opioid exposure after wisdom tooth extraction um, and has um, since passed away from a heroin overdose. Um, and now grandma is left raising her daughter. So these are real stories. Um, and, and when we think about precision medicine as it relates to new persistent opioid use, we often jump straight to genetics. But I would actually argue that we really need to spend a lot of time thinking about phenotype. And, and these are the phenotypes that we see currently associated with that, that development of new chronic opioid use. Anxiety and mood disorders, in particular anxiety, but we know opioids will actually lessen people's anxiety. It'll decrease their anxiety, but maybe not in a positive way. And over time, it'll make their anxiety work. Uh, people use opioids for sleep. There's remote, op there's, there's people who used opioids a long time ago. And then some of these to the right seem quite obvious. People with chronic pain conditions. Again, we understand people use opioids for chronic pain, but um, there are people not getting opioids for chronic pain and they're getting a different surgery. They get an opioid and we see that this population is more likely to keep using their opioids long-term. And the substance use disorder seems quite obvious as well, but to date, and one of the things that we are working on in our group, 
we don't have a high throughput, non-stigmatizing way of screening patients for risk before surgery. And as I said, I've been um, a part of Michigan Genomics Initiative from its inception. Um, we are now to over 70,000 participants. And as I said, most people aren't using opioids. And our exercise, and I've shown this slide probably too many times, um, but we are linking together the electronic health record data, their prescription fulfillment data, and their genetic data to ask the question, is there an association between that exposure after surgery, it, it, between their genetic association between that exposure and new persistent opioid use? Um, this should be easier, and I'm always a little envious of some of the awesome people you've seen, uh, Dr. Dubil and Ganesh, who have um, really robust data from the EHR, uh, from the electronic health record. Our, our data become more complicated because oftentimes they live outside the electronic health record, and sewing together these data has become really challenging. So this is work in progress, but it is work in, in collaboration with School of Public Health, where I think we will continue to make great progress. Um, our team has also understood that informing patients and understanding patients, uh, helping patients understand risks and safety of opioids and how to best manage them is important. And so we've actually made these brochures as part of Michigan Open um, to, to uh, be available to sites. And we actually allow them to brand them. They are available in English, Spanish, and Arabic for free. And I think we have about 500 health centers around the U.S. using these, some of them branded and some not. Um, the next step, and when we think about precision health here, uh, we are interested in ensuring that these um, that these brochures and our guidelines resonate uh, with um, different communities. Uh, when we think about um, other languages, the Spanish and Arabic, do these, do these translate well? Are the messages received? And how are our guidelines uh, received by um, communities of underrepresented minorities? And so this is work we have planned. And, and as we move away from the sort of easier space of taking a lot of opioids and making it less because the reality is, is that's not a precision medicine approach. This is where we start to move into precision medicine. And, and so I, I believe screening for opioid um, related risk, whether it be other substance use disorders or opioid use disorder, is an ethical and appropriate thing to do. And we can do it in a non-stigmatizing way that thinks about and cares for people rather than stigmatize, because this is about counseling, not count canceling, as, as my colleague Jen Walji always says. Um, and I think you know, we want to work on care pathways, detailed um, care pathways that allow people to coordinate um, with the patient, the provider, and their outpatient provider and think about a precision medicine approach. And other work that we have ongoing that is certainly a, a bit further out from where we originally started is this work with the emergency departments across our state using the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan funded collaborative medic run by Keith Coker um, in the Department of Emergency Medicine. We've partnered with these 10 emergency departments to actually give out free naloxone um, to these emergency departments, um, uh, to patients admitted to the emergency department with overdose. Uh, Precision Medicine, Precision Health Initiative uh, funded work by Allison Lynn at the Department of Psychiatry showed that it's only about like 2% or so of the people who present to the ED with an overdose actually leave uh, with an opioid, uh, with a naloxone prescription. So we know that they're at high risk, but we actually aren't giving them the medicine that they need to potentially treat. And what's even scarier is of those people admitted with overdose, um, of, those, of the people admitted with overdose to an ED who go on to die, which is about 25%, 20% of them will die the next day within 24 hours. So we can't make the care pathway go to the pharmacy. We have to put it in hands. And I'm really proud to show this work because this has been ambitious and we really just started in the last year, but we see a major uptick in naloxone distribution. And um, I'll put it out there to my friends at Michigan Medicine. We are lagging behind Hurley Hospital, Sparrow Hospital, the DMC. They're all um, putting us to shame. We've got a lot of work to do to, I, I know we're seeing high risk people. So a little competition here is actually healthy and good and will be, um, will be positive because I think this is doing a lot of good in our community. Um, you know, broadly, uh, our, our work for Michigan Open it integrates with Precision Health, um, but we are doing a, a lot of other things, and I'll touch on a couple of these, especially those that are very Precision Health associated, but um, I just, it, it's, it's not possible in, in this short time to kind of describe the full efforts of the group, but I will hit on a couple. Um, so this My Care Path was developed by Afton Hassett, a clinical psychologist, and Jennifer Walji, who is a surgeon, one of the co-directors of 
of, of Michigan Open and a, the big engine of Michigan Open. Um, and, and what this is, is an app-based app method. So we're actually going to be using the same app that we're currently using in Michigan Genomics Initiative to track patient-reported outcomes. But it's a prehabilitative, pre-surgical uh, uh, effort to treat anxiety the way anxiety should be treated. So thinking about things like mindfulness, meditation, hypnosis, and, and guided imagery as a way to teach people healthy skills for managing anxiety around the time of surgery, as well as some education about surgery, rather than using more opioids. And so I think this is Precision Health. Um, and then uh, really proud of this work. Um, this definitely came out of Precision Health. Um, this is our opioid musical, Painless. Um, it, is, it is our effort with um, the School of Music, Theater, and Dance to, um, to try to think about ways to reach um, kids, in particular high schoolers, early high schoolers, and maybe even middle schoolers through creative content and get them to understand. And so um, this was one of our efforts that was absolutely rocking and rolling, and we were going to be um, doing things that I never dreamed possible until COVID hit. We had um, nine high schools set up. Um, health instructors from these high schools had already um, filled out our baseline survey. And the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services had given us a small pilot grant, as well as in, uh, officially adopted this program as an enhancement to the state's opioid curriculum for high school students um, as a way to, do, to look at this in addition to the normal high school curriculum with the hope that we could engage people in a different way and with the hope that we could actually um, get kids to listen to the curriculum. And I, this is really cool work. So now we're pivoting, we're making a cast album and trying to move into a virtual world because we still think this is really important. So um, I, I can't say enough thanks because I, I got to speak today, but the reality is there's a lot of people and this is a part of the team um, that, that contributes to this work. We have a, an amazingly dynamic and energetic team. We're very proud of our partnership with Precision Health and how that's spilled into collaborations with engineering like the Genoines and um, multiple groups in school of public health, dentistry, and we just really look for, and school of music, theater, and dance, and we just really look forward to um, broadening this effort. And I thank you so much. If you'd like to learn more about Michigan Open, or obviously many people um, know about Precision Health on this call, and yes, Vicki's right, you, you can follow me on Twitter and I will tweet. So I promise. So thanks. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your attention.